Since we're so early in our YouTube channel, I wanted to pick an Alfred Hitchcock film that everybody knows. It's like his biggest movie, you know? It's Rope! Starring James Stewart, Farley Granger, John Dahl, and not Audrey Hepburn. Goodbye, darling. Bye. That's the last time she ever saw him alive. And that's the last time you'll ever see him alive. But yeah, not a lot of people talk about Rope too much whenever it comes to an Alfred Hitchcock film. It's probably my favorite one, to be honest. It's very strange. It's set like a play, how everything sort of takes place in this one setting. It's the first film I ever saw that made me fall in love with how a film is made. And how it's shot. And how it's shot, yes. It's very noticeable for younger audiences. It's very obvious. It's kind of on the nose probably for people who've been watching movies for a long time, but to get the elephant out of the room, it's shot as one giant continuous shot. The whole film. It's not legitimately one continuous shot, because that's like impossible to do, especially at the time. Uh, only reels could only do a certain amount of time before you had to stop or switch camera. A person with a good eye can tell when certain things are intentionally done so they can try to seamlessly cut. Right. It's pretty obvious, especially <laughs> in this movie uh, when he tries, when he cuts it. Well, you know, when I wasn't really good at, I guess, noticing cuts, like I probably would not have noticed why they did that. I would have thought like, oh, that's cool. They went behind the person. I never really knew until I started watching more movies. Um, there's a lot of movies nowadays that do continuous shots. There's uh, the famous shot in Goodfellas, Martin Scorsese. Even Game of Thrones episodes, there are some continuous shots. Uh, Birdman is an entire movie, just like Rope, that was shot as in a continuous shot. Uh, it's a lot longer than Rope. Rope is only an hour and 21 minutes. It's a, I always appreciate it when a movie does a continuous shot like that. It keeps you engaged. Uh, it also has the element of being in a limited setting, which is another type of, I don't know if it's a genre, but it's another type of movie that I enjoy a lot. There's uh, Your Hateful Eight, Reservoir Dogs. Dog Day Afternoon. Dog Day Afternoon, <laughs> which we might talk about here uh, on the show. Uh, Green Room is another one. Even at a young age, I liked The Twilight Zone, and that's kind of how this film feels like. It feels like a giant Twilight Zone episode. It just happens to be 21 minutes longer. I think this film was one of the perfect examples of Alfred Hitchcock being the master of suspense. They call him the master of suspense for a reason, and this film, with it being a continuous shot, he's able to keep you engaged and keep you at the edge of your seat. He's able to sustain the suspense throughout the entire film. The story itself is like, um, you're just waiting to see how it all unravels, and it's sort of slowly just, okay, this is happening, and this is happening, and it kind of snowballs into something eventually happening. It's, it's kind of, it's ahead of its time, really. It, the story is very, very simple. It almost feels like something that would be made today by like 824 or something. This film is about two guys that kill their friend they invite the victim's family over and they have a party. Where the man who they just killed is hidden inside of a Inside a of a chest or a box. And they plan to eat, to have the, have the party, dinner served. dinner served on the chest <laughs> that holds their son's body. So already, that's already a very, very interesting premise. For a 50s film, or 40s film, it's 1948. 40, yeah. The movie starts with an establishing shot of a street and it goes through the entire credits roll because movies back then, they had to go through the entire credits right at the beginning of the film instead of the end. I always thought that was for people who wanted to go get popcorn and use the bathroom as soon as they get there. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Probably. It was a different time. Once it's done, it starts again, and then everybody's, start everybody starts walking in. Um, I, I, felt, I feel like Alfred Hitchcock should have had his cameo at the beginning there because he technically doesn't have his cameo. Well, Alfred, in case you didn't know, Alfred Hitchcock always has a cameo in his movies. Um, but it's like Stanley before Stanley. Yeah. <laughs> well, Stanley, is Stanley. Well, I was thinking M Night Shyamalan. Oh. M Night Shyamalan just shows up in all of his films. Really? Yeah, he thinks he's Alfred Hitchcock. It isn't someone's birthday, is it? Don't look so worried, Kenneth. It's uh, really almost the opposite. 
This film has a very dark sense of humor. People, you could call it tone deaf almost because it doesn't really have a protagonist to cheer for. Well, you do. You do have James. I think Rupert. James is the only yeah person you, you kind of cheer for. You could cheer for Rupert. But even his ideology is kind of strange. After all, murder is, or should be, an art. Not one of the seven lively, perhaps, but an art nevertheless. He based his his belief of being able to kill someone off of Rupert's belief mm -hmm. in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, he is the protagonist, but he's kind of shaky with what he believes in. I love how it just starts off with the murder. Right at the beginning. It's already out of the way. You're not waiting on the murder. That's not the whole purpose. That's the last film. time she ever saw him alive. I love him. I love James Stewart. James Stewart is my favorite. James Stewart, I love him, and Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Powerful enough to control congressmen, and I saw three of them in his room the day I went up to see him. And the Senator yield. No, sir, I will not yield. They kill the friend, they throw his body into the chest, and he opens up a matte painting. Beautiful, beautiful matte painting, city in the background, and it's a city, it's not just a matte painting, it also changes over in time. color over time, it, yeah. it gets darker. I at least appreciate that. They also move the clouds, the clouds move. Too. They move the clouds, mm -hmm. they do a lot of stuff, there's even like smoke. And lights. And lights yeah. that happen later. Um, but I, may, I was able, the last time we watched it very recently, I was able to make a connection between the lighting in the background mm -hmm. and the mood of the specific scene. True. Um, which is very interesting, we'll get into that later. You get a good idea of who the characters are right. after they murder their best friend. Right. Huh? It's a museum piece now. We really should preserve it for posterity, except it's such good crystal and I'd hate to break up the set. David Kentley had his last drink. He's proud. He's proud. It's the last drink that their friend drank before they murdered him. And he calls it a museum piece. And he makes a joke about his choice of drink right before he died, yeah, right before like, he killed him. He, he thinks he's higher than the superior. person he just murdered. He thinks yeah. he's a superior being. And Philip, Philip, Philip already wants to throw up. Philip wants to bark. He's sweating. He doesn't want to be there. And, and it's all very apparent by the way they are all acting. Yes. Um, the acting I love, it's kind of cheesy, but it works in my opinion. How many seconds into the movie is that? And we already know who these people are. Yes, and we, <laughs> we talk about that all the time. I love a great intro to your show or to your movie that establishes its characters very quickly. But their goal, he explains, after they murder him, uh, is to cr create the perfect murder. But he doesn't want it to just be a murder. He wants to, to make it challenging. Brandon, you don't think the party's a mistake, do you? No, the party's the inspired finishing touch to our work. It's more, it's the signature of the artist. Not having it would be like uh, uh, painting the picture and not hanging it. Which is absolutely insane. Brandon, this crazy superior person, wants to have a party. And I love the way it reveals the party. It, it has them talking and then it slowly pans, pans down, down to, the, to the table. So Brandon, like the asshole he is, decides to move the table to the actual chest. Where his best friend is buried. Come with me. What's this all about? You'll see, it's, it's brilliant. It just wasn't enough to have the best friend in another room dead. It wasn't and enough for him. And have dinner in the other room. It's never enough for Why not have it in the same room? It's insane. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. <laughs> and it's funny in a dark way. The, the house. I forgot to get into the house at the beginning. Um, the house is perfectly set up um, like a stage and it's set up to keep it interesting for the viewer. You've got this entire film that's uh, it's an hour and 21 minutes long and it takes place in the same area. Things change, they're gonna wanna see different environments around them. So you have the kitchen area, you have the middle hallway, and then you have the yeah, living room. Really. Yeah. He has the matte, the matte painting in the background that changed color over time. Mm -hmm. And he also has a door in between each area 
So you can get people walking in and out of the frame. You can get people walking away from the frame and closer to the frame. He angles it sometimes uh, to the right so you can see the different layers and the different rooms. Yes. So you'll know uh, this person's coming out from here, they're going there. Yes. You can really see inside of this home pretty well. Yeah, and I heard that they, they wanted to make it set up like a play, obviously. Um, they actually had two of the walls had roll rollers on them oh. so for some shots they had to move the walls out of the way so they could place the camera in front of it but wow. then they would have the camera inside of the shot so they'd have to move the walls back right. into place and I think one of those walls had that scary ass picture that we saw oh. in one of the frames why is that there so Mrs. Wilson comes who I assume is the Their maid way? yeah I the so. the maid uh, and the first thing she notices is that they moved the dinner table. The first thing she notices is that the table has been moved. Why did you move my shit? I had it set up so nicely. Not only that, but she also noticed how she had to go run on an errand that took much longer than it needed to. Yes. So she already has these two questions going on in her head. Yes, and that's, that's what I love. love. It's, it's so suspenseful because every character that walks in either notices something different <laughs> or notices something pertaining to David. Yeah, that's true. It's that's so true. Awesome. They're asking, where is David? Mm -hmm. So Philip notices that he kept the rope hanging and he, get, he freaks out. Yeah, he freaks out and snatches it up. Yeah, Brandon, no, Brandon grabs it. And then he, uh, which it leads to one of my favorite scenes. Brandon shows how cocky he is. He's like, it's just a household item. And then he flips it and whistles, twirls it around. Twirls it around. He goes into the kitchen and it's one of my favorite shots ever. Wilson. Yeah? There's a uh, champagne in the icebox. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, the way it was shot, I love it. It feels like a stage play. It feels like something you see if you're an audience member and you're sitting down to play, you see somebody walk into a building and then they cleverly have it open up and then you see them drop it in and then close it and then the audience kind of laughs. Yeah, it's he did it comically too. It's comical. It's hilarious. Brandon announces to Philip that their good friend Rupert is coming over. And immediately you can tell Philip has a problem with this. Uh, Rupert is this smart man, Rupert, played by James Stewart. Wasn't he like their teacher or something? He's a big philosopher, and they talk about how he has a philosophy that they agree with and that Rupert might even agree with them murdering someone. They think that James Stewart is going to agree with... Brandon murder. thinks that. Brandon thinks Philip that. Philip is like... Philip's not about it. No. Brandon, of all the people on this earth, Rupert Cadell is the one man most likely to suspect. He's the one man who might appreciate this from our angle, the artistic one. <laughs> but Brandon sees it as a challenge. He thinks Rupert, this really, really smart philosopher, coming over and not noticing that they murdered someone is a great challenge. I just feel so sorry for Philip because he's going through so much anxiety and just mental and emotional stress because of Brandon. And he's also trying to hook uh, Janet, David, David's the David's victim. David's fiance. David's fiance is coming over and they're trying to hook him up with their friend Kenneth. Who she used to date. And right. so now Brandon is trying to get her to go back with Kenneth. I don't know why. He's just a, a shit Brandon's stir. fucking crazy. He's a shit stir. Why is he even doing this? <laughs> David's dad, David the victim. David's dad and his sister walk in next. Um, and the first thing his sister says is, David! David! Oh, no, no, uh, this is, uh, you've made a mistake. Th this is Kenneth Lawrence. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, that's all right, Anita. Which freaks out Philip, and it builds on the tension even more, because Philip's already nervous about all this. She does horoscope, so maybe she sort of felt his presence, or she smelled his cologne, yeah, she's maybe. Yeah, she's very superstitious. She's into the stars. She's very superstitious, stuff. so for her to think that David is in the room. Was really creepy. Was, yeah, played a big part in yeah. Philip's mind. And no. he starts playing the piano. And then when he starts playing the piano, it pans to the left and reveals my boy. Oh, Miss Walker. How'd you know? Brandon's spoken of you. Did he do me justice? Do you deserve justice? James Stewart, he walks in and he starts riffing on everyone. And he immediately starts to tell that something's wrong exactly what Philip expected. Champagne, it is. That's 
Very good champagne, too. What's the occasion? Well, I told you on the phone. It's... What's going on? What's, what, what you got? Why do you have champagne and for a, a situation like this? You two are acting like you just committed a murder. You people act like you've committed a murder. At this point, Brandon starts to talk about Philip strangling a chicken. And in the yard, Philip was doing likewise to the next of two or three chickens. 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 For some reason, Philip ended up strangling a chicken at one point in his life. And Philip freaks out. Lazarus, he rose. That's a lie, Philip. And uh, this is one of the big things I noticed uh, as we were rewatching it. Every 20 minutes back then, during this film, Alfred Hitchcock had to switch cameras. And it's very, very noticeable throughout the entire movie, but he tries to hide it. He tries to mask it by zooming in usually to a person's suit and then zooming out, right? Mm -hmm. It's a hard cut. It's not a oh. cut he tries to hide. Philip yells, that's a lie. Mm -hmm. And then it's a hard cut to James Stewart, and we get James Stewart's reaction to it. In the back of the viewer's mind, we're used to one long shot, one long take. It, it's very, very smooth. Alfred manages to convey how startling and jarring the jump was by having it cut. Because in the back of your head, you're so used to a long flowing shot, he has it cut very hard at this one moment. So you feel that it's startling and James Stewart feels that it's startling and we get his reaction. I'm in quite an embarrassing position. So it's really, really funny. This is the scene where he starts to play on the piano. And it's a very, very well done, suspenseful and intense scene. And this is when Rupert begins to interrogate him. And, uh, you know, Rupert's kind of like poking around for questions. And Philip's trying to keep his cool, you know, playing the piano. When you mess with your fingers a lot, it helps you to stay calm. But uh, Rupert's constantly like, why did you disagree to strangling a chicken? I, I could have sworn I was there and I saw you do it. So why did you lie about something that's true? And as time goes on and he keeps interrogating him, the tone of the piano starts to change. A lot of things start to change. I actually had a, I actually made a giant list of things that happened while during that scene. During the scene, right when he starts playing the piano, James Stewart walks up to him on the piano. Mm -hmm. First thing he does is turn on the turn light. Turn on the light <laughs> to distract him. Huh? To distract Philip. He turns on the light, and it, obviously it's, it's too much light. I don't like to play with light in my eyes. Right after he turns off the light, I think sirens start to blare in the background. Yes, Philip, I asked you a question. Well, what was it? And James, at the same time, James is asking him questions. Do you think he intentionally started to ask him the questions to distract him? Yes, so oh, absolutely, distracted. absolutely. <laughs> James Stewart meant to do it, and Alfred Hitchcock purposefully made the scene this way to make it more intense and to make it like an interrogation. Mm -hmm. uh, he starts to play a bit faster. I wish I could come straight out with what I want to know. Unfortunately, I don't know anything. James Stewart starts to turn on the metronome. I must say. All right, I'll ask you. What do you suspect? And he turns on the metronome, and it's obviously going off tone with what he's trying to play on the piano while he's trying to interrogate him. Where's David, Philip? I don't know. Why? Brandon knows. Giving him more wacky ways to become distracted. Yes. Philip finds out that Rupert is kind of going off track and he's kind of wrong. And you can hear the piano slow down and go back to normal pace. Uh, and then Philip laughs and he's like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> what? What's the matter? What are you laughing about? Nothing. What is What up? Rupert stops the metronome. But then Rupert has another idea and he starts to turn on the metronome again. You're uh, more than usually allergic to the truth tonight, Philip. And it gets even more intense and it gets even faster and now... Now, Philip, what do you lie to me for? Because I don't like to talk about... About what? Strangling I can't play with, I think. All of these small things in this one scene, it puts you on the edge of your seat. James Stewart finally gets it. Philip stops playing and he notices the rope around the books because Brandon brings it up and it, the books go into frame. James sees him looking at the books and he's wondering like, what, what, what's, what's wrong with those books? I mean, I don't care if he has them, I just, what, what? I just think it's a clumsy way of tying them up, that's all right. David never had any trouble taking care of himself. 
Oh, yes, he's always been after me to be more punctual. <laughs> God damn it, Philip. You can't do, do shit with Philip. And so next we have a really, really nice long shot. And here's a, a great use of the set that they have. Uh, Mrs. Wilson is taking down the table. She's taking down the dinner table. And she's walking back and forth while they're having a conversation about trying to find David. Hearing people wondering, uh, where's David? But we know where David is and we're constantly seeing him while they're talking about him. Yes. And, and then the aunt gets worried to the point where she wants to call the police. And then we get a nice horizontal pan where we get everyone's reactions. It, it, it like pans to the right and we get Philip, we get John Dahl, and we get James Stewart. Mm -hmm. Looking at them, he's like looking straight at him. Mm -hmm. And Brandon decided to give the rope to David's father because it's part of his dark sense of humor. And to get rid of the murder weapon. Oh my God, it's brilliant. That is brilliant. That It actually is. Just to get rid of the evidence, if they do find the body and they see that he's been strangled. Yeah. So everyone starts to leave, and then James Stewart puts on the wrong hat. And he looks at it, and it says Finish. Donkey Kong on it. <laughs> and uh, by, at that point, he knows. He knows what has happened. And then right when he figures it out, it pans to the right, and we see the matte painting is now nighttime, which I love. I love that he, Alfred Hitchcock, was able to establish the tone of the scene and what's happening in the film with that matte painting and the time of day, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, it's damn near nighttime at this point. They're yelling at each other. Uh, Philip's hoping this is all a bad dream. And the phone rings, and it's James Stewart saying he left his fucking cigar box. Right in his room, but what? he wants to come up. He says he left a cigarette case here. He wants to come up. Yeah, Philip freaks out and he puts the phone down and uh, Philip goes over to Brandon and he's like, he knows, he knows, he's gonna come here. And then Philip, no, Brandon slaps him and he's like, shut up. It's comical, <laughs> it's like it's like slapstick. And yeah. he left the phone off the hook. I'm sure he hurt. So it's pretty damn obvious James Stewart heard everything. No, he's lying, he's caught on, he'll leave it. I won't get back to that phone. I won't get back to that phone. Brandon, I can't. No, he knows. <laughs> I mean, even though I don't agree with what Brandon has done, but Philip's the fucking worst. So James comes back and he's like, he's like, oh, I left my cigar box. It's somewhere around here. Uh, this is all kind of strange. And he's like, what kind of strange? And he's putting his hand in his pocket and the camera pans to the left and it pans over to the right. And you can see that James is obviously looking at his pocket. Mm -hmm. James starts to explain what he thought happened. Mm -hmm. And the camera is slowly panning between the room to show that... The different locations. The different locations. And you can kind of imagine it in your head about mm -hmm. like where it, ha what happened. And I'd bring him in here, make some small talk to put him at his ease, probably offer him a drink, and then he'd sit down. Yes. I'd try to make it all very pleasant, you understand. That was extremely clever. I really, really love that form of storytelling. I love it, but it was very obvious to see that the chair moved. Right when James Stewart reveals the rope, the street lights came, came on, which is implying that it is now officially night, basically. Mm -hmm. um, night is here, your worst nightmare is here. Philip freaks out, finally, and they have an awkward little gunfight. I told you we'd find out, but oh no, no, you have to have him here, and now we're done for, now I don't, no, you made me do it, and I hate you, I hate both of us, I, no, 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 no. And James is like, I'm tired, I'm tired, I just, I just want to take a look in that chest, I just want to see what's in the chest, and he walks up to it, he opens it, which you can see it's another cut, and it reveals James Stewart's reaction. And right when it shows his reaction, it's a red, red flash from the street light, which I thought was cool. Uh, James Stewart fires the weapon outside of the house to let the police let know. Everyone know. Yeah, let everyone know. Let everyone know to call the police. Yeah, and you start to hear the sirens, and then we have a slow pan. It almost pans out to the point where it's the audience perspective. Yeah. It really looks like a stage at that point, which is kind of like taking you out of the movie and it's, it's putting you back in your seat. As I said before, this film has so much 
work put into it. And that's the end of the movie. It's a very, very simple story, very simple premise. It's very short. Very, very An short. hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. And it's a great gateway movie for people that want to get into film. Mm. It's, it's very obvious to see how much work was put into it. You know, these actors had to do long takes. It's always challenging to do a long take and to act for that long in a film. It's so much work for the director, for the set people having to move things around in the background, all frame for people to not see, and yeah, the actors to have to act through it. What would you give this if you were to give this rating? I'd give it a 9. Only because of just, I guess, just nitpicky things like Philip on the piano and only one hand is moving and the other one isn't. I don't know. Was... That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, it's not a perfect movie. I mean, there's a reason why people don't talk about Rope as much as they do Psycho or North by Northwest or something like that. Or Vertigo, really. But it is really great. I think that people should still watch anyways because those things are just really nitpicky. Yes, and I'll give it a 9 also. I feel like that's a... That's about right for what I feel about this film. Mm. Um, but yeah, check it out, y'all.